tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Sing it with me, Chester. It's just you and me against the world, brother. Come on. Just sing this this once for me. Oh, I know you can, bud. But, oh, hey, 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 I guess we ain't so alone as we thought we were, Chester. Hey, friend, shouldn't you be at home watching New Year's Rockin' Eve? You know, with that Dick Seacrest feller. To think you chose me over him. I tell you, I'm just tickled pink. Chester, if you think you're getting another kiss at midnight, You've got another thing coming. Why don't you go find a carcass to nibble on? Sorry about that, friend. Crustaceans get clingy at times, especially around the holidays. Come on in and have a seat. I'll only be a minute. Mmm. Ooh, that's better. So what's your New Year's resolution? Me? I'm gonna quit drinking. Doctor says he bets my liver looks like a catcher's mitt. I told him, what does he know? He's full of shit. But then he lobs a ball at me and I caught it with my liver. Instinctively, you know. Just kind of reached out and snapped it up. Hmm. I thought, maybe he's got a point. So smoke them if you got them and drink those juice boxes to the bottom. Because old Drew Blood has a tell to tell. This is Season 1, Episode 14 of Drew Blood. You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and all our other episodes, as well as hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today to get instant access from our friends at Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights. Thank you for your support. And authors, the Drew Blood Podcast is accepting submissions. Got a good one? Send it to DrewBloodHorror at gmail.com. If accepted, your story will rain down on the multitudes like morning manna. And you? They'll make statues of your ass. You can count on it. Tonight, we've got a brand new story, never before read on Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights. Never. Not even once. Well... Maybe once, but never by me. That's got to count for something, doesn't it? In any case, some tales beg to be told, especially while podcasters beg for release forms to be signed. Not to break the fourth wall or anything. In this tale, we join a young man moving out on his own for the first time, during which he encounters the ghostly remnants of a time long past, but definitely not forgotten. So, without further delay, I give you, from author Jeff Sturdivant, The Black Suit. Mattress yoked over his shoulders like a man condemned to bear it, Jack Stewart made his way up the final flight of stairs to the fifth floor of the Irving Gardens apartment building. From his pocket dangled the green key fob to his new studio. He dropped the mattress in front of the door, apartment 514, and stuck the key in the corroded old doorknob. It was 5 p.m., a ray of dwindling sunlight cutting down the wall from the window at the end of the hallway. By dark, he should be completely moved in. It was only the bed, a handful of bags, and a celebratory case of bud. He dragged the mattress inside and dropped it in the corner where he figured he'd set up camp. The hollow thump of an empty room. The occasion seemed diffused with a kind of sweet loneliness he both cherished and dreaded. For the first time ever, he was completely on his own. Solitude. 
independence. Twenty minutes later, he was ascending the stairs with the last of his bags slung over his shoulder. These he dropped in a pile by the mattress and opened one to fish out his pillow. He dropped the pillow on the bed and laid down on his back. Looking around, he tried to familiarize himself with the cracks in the bowed plaster ceilings and walls. Warped woodwork painted over so heavily as to fill in the bevels. Somewhere under all that latex was certainly lead. Old transgressions buried forever. After a while, he got up and inspected the bathroom. It looked to have been upgraded sometime in the 70s. He scrutinized the corroded chrome fixtures and flaky grout between the floor tiles. He turned the toilet's flush lever, but nothing happened. Under the lid of the tank, he saw the chain connecting the lever and flapper had snapped. No luxury accommodations were the Irving Gardens apartments. But for one dollar per square foot of personal space, it was surely a bargain. Whatever it took, he'd make it livable. Jack went back to the main room and took a beer out of the case and popped the top. He began unpacking his things. His only furniture was a table, two chairs, and a dresser. He tucked his shirts and pants into the bottom drawers and his socks and underwear on top. There was a closet between the front door and bathroom with a dressing mirror hung on the door. He took his coat to the closet, hoping the previous tenant had left him a hanger or two. When he opened it, though, he found more than just a hanger. There was a suit hanging inside, a black jacket and matching pants. That's interesting. He unhooked the suit and brought it out to have a look. He was no expert on formal wear, but he thought the suit looked pretty nice, if not a little out of style. Fine looking fabric, whatever it was. He checked for the make, but there were no labels in either the collar or the pants. Feeling faintly silly, he brought the jacket to his face and sniffed. It looked brand new, but was a little musty from closet time. Must have been in there for quite a while. Jack hung the suit back up and folded his own jacket and tucked it up on the top shelf. He fished a business card out of his pocket, the one Al gave him along with his room key earlier in the day. Al was the superintendent, an ex-prize fighter and lifelong handyman in his 70s. He'd been living in and maintaining this building for 40 years. Good chance he'd laid down a lot of that lead paint himself. He'd lost his wife 35 years ago, he'd said lived here alone ever since. He must know who the suit belonged to. It was also a good excuse to summon him about the minor toilet problem. Jack leaned against the closet door and dialed Al's number. This is Al. The gruff old voice came. Hey, it's Jack, the new guy in 514. Let me guess, the toilet. Jack chuckled. <laughs> so you already know about it? I gotta get to the hardware store. I was gonna quick fix it with the pull chain from the closet light, but I thought better of it. Hey, speaking of the closet, what's the story with the suit in there? Do you know? Mm, right, yeah, the suit. Forgot to tell you about that. After a weird little pause, Al cleared his throat. <clears> throat> Just leave it be if it's all the same to you. Uh, whose is it? It isn't exactly anybody's. Just think of it as a part of the apartment. Know what I mean? Like a uh, part of the apartment's history? Another pause, this one a bit longer. Uh, kinda like that. Uh, if you could just leave it be, I'd appreciate it. Uh, you don't bother it. It won't bother you. Satisfied. He was anything but satisfied. Al's responses had only made him curious. But the conversation was getting uncomfortable, so he decided to let it go. Hey, fair enough, Jack said. Yeah, thanks, buddy. I'll get to the store tomorrow. Probably pick up a bunch of those chains. Seems like everybody's a rusting up. Hard water, you know. Yeah, gotcha, Jack said. Uh, thanks, Al. Jack hung up. He polished off the beer and uncapped the second. Nothing like a few drinks to make you feel more at home, 
even in a hundred-year-old studio with a mysterious suit in the closet. A suit that wouldn't bother him if he didn't bother it. What a mysterious thing to say about a suit. A few beers later and he was hooking up his VCR to the TV. Son of a, bitch. a box set of Columbo episodes to continue the evening's mystery theme. He unpacked his toiletries, showered, and brushed his teeth. He piled his luggage to make an impromptu sofa and settled in to watch TV. By his side, the empty beer bottles accumulated. Three, four, six, eight. The sweet sense of loneliness turned in only to sweet. Three episodes into the first season of Columbo, Jack was snoring soundly into a pile of linens. Jack woke sometime in the night with an odd sense of foreboding. Quiet in the city streets below. Yellow arc sodium lamplight cast a strange long shadow across the floor and onto the wall. He turned his head. He froze. There, in front of the window, stood the form of a headless man. It took him a moment to recognize what he was looking at. It was the suit, the weird old suit from the closet, standing there like someone was wearing it, like it was looking out the window. <sighs> Am I dreaming? Hallucinating? He watched silently, both he and the suit unmoving. It had to be a dream, a drunken, exhausted dream brought on by his uneasiness in the new apartment. But no. He was wide awake. That left hallucinating. Was he a schizo all of a sudden? Should he add that to his list of problems? Or was it a ghost? There's no fucking way, he said. Seizing on a moment of courage, he rolled out of bed and made for the suit. Whether he meant to grab it or tackle it, he didn't even know. He was 21 years old and he wasn't going to be spooked like a little kid just because he was alone in a new place. He dashed for it, but by the time he got to the window, the suit was lying on the floor, its ghostly contents apparently emptied. He just stood there for a minute, half relieved, half confused, looking down at the crumpled heap. He checked his watch. 3.15 a.m. <sighs> Don't bother the suit and it won't bother you, huh? Jack didn't know what the hell had just happened, but this much he did know. The suit bothered him. Jack gathered it up, holding it like something soiled. He opened the door and walked down the hall and stuffed the suit into the trash chute. He shut the door and went back to the apartment and washed his hands in the sink. Feeling silly for doing so, he examined the room for any ghostly ephemera he might have missed. Satisfied, he took one more beer from the case and stood drinking it by the window. He looked outside, saw the dark silhouette of the meat plant on the edge of town. The blinking radio tower. The old billboard overlooking the highway near the police outpost. What the hell had just happened? He set the empty beer bottle on the windowsill and went back to bed. Eventually, he fell asleep. When Jack woke up, the sun was strong in the window. His head throbbed. He checked his watch, 11.30 a.m. It was a minute before last night's episode came to mind. The whole thing felt like a drunken fever dream. How drunk had he been anyway? Turning to look, he counted the empty beer bottles arranged like bowling pins next to the mattress. All right, so I must have been pretty drunk. Jack peeled himself off the mattress and went to the closet and opened it. There was the suit, hanging where he had left it yesterday. Just as he had thought, the whole thing had been a drunken dream. In the wake of it, though, the suit still gave him the creeps. What was it about that thing? Jack showered and dressed and emerged on the city streets in search of a strong cup of coffee. At the local coffee shop around the corner, he saw a familiar face behind the newspaper. It was Al, the super. Ah, hey Al, Jack said. Al looked up from his paper. 
Ah, hey, ya buddy. I'll be by later on to fix that flapper. Everything else okay so far? Ah, I slept pretty bad my first night, but I guess that's to be expected. Uh, me too, Al said. Got up around 3.15 by someone slamming the trash chute. Why on earth would someone need to take out the trash at 3 in the morning is a mystery to me. Uh, wasn't you, was it, buddy? Nah, not me. Uh, well, my apartment's right under there. Work the trash chute that late and you're sure to wake me up. Something to keep in mind, huh? Hey, I'll keep it in mind. Mm, good, Al said. As for the toilet, just give me an hour or two. That's fine, Jack said. Al returned to his paper and Jack sat at the bar and ordered coffee. He gazed down at the sports section the previous diner had left behind, but he wasn't reading. He was replaying last night's dream in his mind, wherein he actually had used the trash chute at 3.15 a.m., one hell of a coincidence, sure, but that's all it could have been, right? First of all, suits just don't walk out of closets and stand by windows. Second of all, it was still right there in the closet to begin with. Coincidences happened, Jack thought. A couple of hours later, Jack was unpacking the last of his things. There was a knock on the door, and Jack answered it to find Al holding a section of beaded chain and tin snips. Hey, thanks for coming by, Jack said. Yeah, it's a quick fix, buddy. I'll be right out of your way. Yeah, sure thing. Al slowed as he walked by the closet door on the way to the bathroom. He appeared to want to look inside, but stopped himself. The two men met eyes. Mm, so you saw the suit, Al said. Of course he had. They had already discussed it. Why so mysterious about it, if you don't mind me asking? Al gestured as though to brush it off. Nah, nothing mysterious, he said. Like I said, buddy, just leave it be, huh? But why? Al went to the bathroom and lifted the lid off the toilet tank. Was he trying to ignore him? Jack wouldn't have it. He opened the closet and unhooked the suit. Displaying it like a haberdasher, he carried it to the bathroom and cleared his throat so Al would look. He did, with eyes suddenly wide. <sighs> what are you doing with that? Didn't I say to leave it be? I don't see the harm in it. Tell me what you know about it. Why not just leave it be? Why are you so insistent that I leave it alone? Is there something about this thing I should know? Al sighed. It was pretty clear Jack wasn't letting this go. <sighs> Look, I don't want to freak you out, buddy. It's a strange thing is all. <laughs> You're not going to freak me out, Jack said. I'm not a kid. I just want to know what the big deal is. Al set down the tin snips and held up his hands in supplication. <sighs> Fine. You want to know, buddy? I'll tell yous. Creakily, the old man sat down on the edge of the bathtub. He regarded the suit in Jack's hands like something fundamentally offensive. <sighs> it's been here as long as I have. Everyone who ever lived in this room wanted to get rid of it. They'd leave it by my door, throw it out with the trash, whatever. <sighs> But every time, it'd end up right back in the closet. All by itself. No one knows how or why. Jack paused. That's impossible. Uh, you'd think, huh? But it's the truth. That's why I told you to leave it alone. Save you the trouble of getting spooked when you do the same thing. It's hard enough getting tenants in this old place. And once they get spooked, they all want to run out on me. Jack searched Al's face for signs he was joking, but there were none. He glanced at the suit in his arms, then at the window where he imagined it standing in a dream. Then, for the first time, he noticed the empty beer bottle sitting on the windowsill. The one he had put there before going back to bed. I can't believe it. 
It really happened. Al seemed to pick up on Jack's inner monologue. Mm, you already tried getting rid of it, didn't you? Jack looked back at Al. After a pause, he said, It was me at the trash shoot last night. Al let out a little chuckle, shook his head. <laughs> you know, people tend to be afraid of what they don't understand. But there's no need to be afraid. The suit belongs in the closet. All you gotta do is leave it there. <sighs> I guess it just kinda gave me the creeps, Jack said. Uh, I hear you, buddy boy, but the last thing either of us need to be thinking about is an old suit. So why don't you just hang it back up and we'll both put it out of our minds, huh? From now on, just think of it as part of the woodwork. Fair enough. Jack nodded. He returned to the closet and hung the suit back on the rod. It seemed to watch him as he closed the door. Part of the woodwork, he reminded himself. Al fixed the toilet and repositioned the lid. They shook hands and Al left. With that, Jack returned to unpacking. He put on the bed clothes, finished setting up his entertainment center, and unpacked the rest of his toiletries. The suit crept into his mind from time to time, but he forced the thoughts away. Just part of the woodwork. Don't bother the suit, and the suit won't bother you. Jack woke in the night to freezing cold. The drapes around the window were billowing in the wind. Had he left it open last night? It was freezing outside. Why would he have opened it in the first place? He threw the covers off but stopped in his tracks. It was the suit again. It was standing by the side of the bed, not facing the window. This time, it was facing him. I'm not drunk. I'm not dreaming. I'm not hallucinating. So what now? What do you want from me? He whispered. At first nothing happened. But then a kind of airy relaxation seemed to come over the suit. Almost like it responded to his voice. What do you want? He asked again. It felt awkward talking to something he didn't quite believe himself. But again, the suit appeared to respond. The shoulders slumped a bit. The cuffs ruffled. Is there something you want from me? The suit relaxed even more now. Where it had been mannequin stiff a minute ago, it now seemed outsized on something smaller. Gently, it began to drift. The arms folded inward. The pants folded lengthwise, then bent at the knees. While Jack sat trembling, the suit folded neatly, all by itself. Then it drifted slowly onto his lap. Jack didn't move. Moments later, the window began to close, the curtains relaxing on their rods. After that, everything was still. Jack checked his watch. It was 3.21 a.m. Jack looked down at the suit, unsure what to do next. The way it had presented itself to him seemed more like a gift than a threat. Was that what it wanted? This ghost, spirit, whatever, to give him the suit? Or was he supposed to do something with it? Put it on? The suit was roughly his size, but what would happen if he put on a haunted outfit? Still, he felt distinctly that this was what it wanted him to do. But why? Should I call Al? He checked his watch again. Bad idea. But there was surely no getting back to sleep tonight. He carried the suit to the table and popped a cap off of a beer and sat drinking. He kept an eye around the room for more ghostly evidence, but it was just him and the suit. A few beers later, his nerves were suitably settled. He stared at the suit, wondering what to do. All right, he said to the empty room, although he knew it wasn't truly empty. With a subtle sensation of being watched, he dropped his shorts. He unbuttoned the pants and slipped them on. He stood and looked down at them. They fit just right, even without a belt. Then he took the jacket, slipped it on, and buttoned it. He looked in the dressing mirror. Not bad, he thought. So what now? 
He waited a minute, but nothing happened. Stillness in the room. Nothing ghostly. Nothing revelatory. Starting to unbutton the jacket, he glanced back in the mirror. That's weird. The reflection in the mirror was somehow brighter than the room itself. In the window behind him, the orange glow of the setting sun. He turned around, but night was black as ever. Back in the mirror, it looked more like late evening. So vain, Charlie. When he turned again, the whole room looked like it did in the mirror. There was a woman there, an attractive brunette in an evening gown. She looked set to go out on the town. So did he, he realized. I'm so happy you came, darling. The woman embraced him, a soft waft of perfume. He embraced her back, but not of his own doing, he realized. He wasn't in control, and the room he noticed was nothing like it had been. It looked newer, bright and clean. Wallpaper in place of the old, drab paint. Gaudy carpeting over the wide wooden planks. No one happier than me, Doris. I'm the luckiest man alive tonight. The words came out in an unfamiliar voice. It wasn't he who had spoken them. He was inside this man, this Charlie, wearing the same suit. He was just going along for the ride. You just might be, she said. She kissed him. He kissed her back deeply and passionately. He felt everything. He just wasn't doing it. How long do we have? Charlie asked. I want to cherish every moment. The bastard won't be back until Saturday. I want you with me every moment until then. If he hits you again, Doris, even once. The minute the insurance money comes in, I'll divorce the bastard. Then you'll have me all to yourself. No more sneaking around ever again. I can't stand how he hurts you. How could anyone hurt you? She caressed his face. It won't be long, darling. I promise. Suddenly, there was a ruckus out in the hallway. Both she and Charlie turned their heads. When their eyes met again, there was terror in Doris's face. No, she said. The door crashed open. There was a man in the doorway. A brawny, mustachioed brute in slacks and an undershirt. A little drool in the corner of his mouth. A familiar face. Just much, much younger. It was Al. I knew it, he growled. Al. Doris said. It's not what it looks like. He rushed her. Charlie got between them, but Al caught him on the chin with a vicious punch. Jack felt every bit of it, felt his knees go weak, heard his ears ringing. You're drunk, Al! Shut up, you cheating tramp, whore! Al's meaty palm connected with Doris's face with a sound like a thunderclap. Something wet splattered across Charlie's face, and he knew immediately it was blood. Doris collapsed bonelessly on the carpet. And you, buddy boy. Charlie got his bearings and threw a punch of his own. Al ducked it. He countered with a hook to the ribs and a brutal cross to the side of his head. Charlie's face hit the floor and the world went dark. Jack woke to muffled sobs. Whore. Filthy whore. He turned his head. Doris was prone, her face buried in the carpet, her dress torn off and thrown aside. Al on top of her, his pants around his knees, his forearm on the back of her neck. Get off her, Charlie groaned. Hey, if it ain't sleeping beauty, I'll get off your little girlfriend soon as I'm done with her. Charlie struggled, but he couldn't move. His wrists and ankles were bound with torn strips of Doris's dress. <laughs> you son of a bitch. You'll never get away with this. Al only humped more ferociously, grinding his forearm harder into the back of Doris's neck. A few last thrusts, and he ceased his assault. He pushed himself off of her and got to his feet and buckled his pants. Then he wound up a foot and kicked her hard in the side. <sighs> 
Get away with what? Making love to my own wife? I haven't even got started with you yet, buddy. Just leave her alone. Please, Al. Grinning, Al walked to the kitchen area. From a drawer, he extracted a large rolling pin. He weighed it in his hand, gripped it by a handle, and swung it like a bat. Jack's heart and Charlie's heart were one, racing in his chest. <laughs> I'll leave the both of you alone. Don't you worry about it. Alone in a goddamn hole. Please, Al. Don't do anything you're going to regret. Regret? He turned to look at his wife, battered and bleeding on the carpet. <sighs> Think she regretted all the running around she's been doing? <sighs> Not until tonight, she didn't. I'll bet she regrets it now, though, don't you think, buddy boy? <laughs> I know what you do to her, Charlie said. I see the cuts, the bruises. How can you blame her for trying to get away from you? <sighs> She's my property. Al brought the rolling pin down in the middle of her back with a sickening thwomp. Doors screamed. The blow seemed to leave an artificial arch where there wasn't one before. Stop! Al! He brought it down again, this time on her right shoulder, then again on her left, with each blow her body thrown into unnatural contortions. The final blow, hardest of them all, sunk into the back of her head. Their marriage, along with her agonies, promptly brought to a close. Oh, God, Doris. Al straightened up, his eyes full of blue insanity. He turned his attention to Charlie. Till death do us part, right, buddy? Guess that about does it. You murdered her. You got it all wrong, buddy. You murdered her. You killed the bitch when you decided to mess with another man's property. And look at what you got yourself into. Now you've gone and killed yourself too. <laughs> Charlie didn't even have time to protest. The rolling pin landed on his back. Vertebrae crushed. Again on his ribs. Again on his shoulder. His knees. His elbows. Jack being pummeled, crushed. Only when the final blow came was he delivered from the agony. He saw white, then red, then black. When he woke again, the pain was gone. He was in the trunk of a moving car, a muffled tune playing over the radio. He smelled excrement, blood. He felt the car turn, then the rumble of gravel underneath. Soon it came to a stop. Momentarily, the trunk creaked open. A clear night sky and Al's wild eyes. <sighs> Enjoy the ride, buddy boy. Charlie didn't answer. He couldn't answer. Jack knew why. Charlie was dead. Jack was alive inside of him, but Charlie, Charlie was dead. So was Doris. Al seized him by the lapels of his jacket and dragged him out of the trunk, dumped him on the ground. He landed face up. He could make out the car by the back of it, an early 60s Chevy Impala. Al pulled out Doris and dumped her next to him. He just stood there a minute, chest heaving, looking crazily about. He wiped his forehead with the back of his sleeve. <sighs> Ladies first. You don't mind, do ya, buddy boy? Hal stepped out of Jack's field of vision. He heard Doris's body dragging through the gravel. Dragging, quieter, gone. When Al came back, the moon was high in the sky. <sighs> Sorry to keep you waiting, buddy boy. 
How Jack wanted to answer him. He had never felt so hopeless, not once in his life. Al lifted his legs and started to drag him. Charlie's head lolled, giving him a different view of his surroundings. Behind the trees to the left, he thought he recognized something. The bulletin board. I, I think I know where we are. As Al dragged him further along, he tried to picture from the perspective of his apartment window where they might be headed. The bulletin board was near the edge of town. The old meat plant was far off to the left. Meanwhile, they were going into the woods. Charlie's head hit something in the ground and turned to the right, giving Jack a different view. Now he could see the blinking red light of the radio tower. The radio tower off to the right. The small patch of woods. We must be. A glimpse of a picnic area confirmed it. Gilbert Park. <sighs> you should have brought your bathing trunks, buddy boy. <sighs> Shame about that nice suit. Gilbert Lake. He killed his wife, killed this guy, and dumped him in Gilbert Lake 35 years ago. And the suit, it's Charlie. He's been trying to tell me what happened. Trying to. With the revelation, Jack felt himself slipping away. The last things he heard were the gentle lapping of water against the bank, heavy chains in the floor of a boat, some muffled swear, followed by a comment on Doris's weight. But from all to follow, he'd be spared. He found himself back in the front of his mirror in the dark and dingy apartment, present day. He unbuttoned the jacket, slipped out of it, let the pants drop to the floor. He turned from the mirror, looked at the spot on the floor where 35 years ago, Doris and Charlie were murdered. He could still see Al on top of Doris, raping her, beating her to death before his very eyes. Even worse, he could still feel the rolling pin crashing into his own back, his own ribs, his own skull. By proxy, Al had killed him too, and he'd gotten away with all of it. Gritting his teeth, Jack picked up the phone and started calling the police. But he stopped. What would he tell them? How could he prove it? There were two bodies in Gilbert Lake. There was no doubt in Jack's mind, but buried in 35 years of silt and sediment. Meanwhile, if he told the cops the truth, they'd throw him in the loony bin. So what was he supposed to do? He checked his watch, 3.30 a.m. The whole thing had taken only 30 minutes. He had truly been transported to another time. All the while, the murderer was sleeping soundly downstairs without a care in the world. Sleeping soundly, having not only murdered Doris and Charlie, but also murdered him. Fuck this! Enraged, Jack stormed out into the hall, went to the trash chute and began slamming the door. He slammed the door over and over, slammed it until he heard the footsteps in the stairwell. Kept slamming until he saw the murderer's silhouette in the moonlit window at the end of the hallway. Jack, are you out of your mind? I know what you did, Jack said, leveling a finger at the man. <sighs> what he is talking about? Jack took a few steps toward him. You beat him to death. You dumped him in the lake. By now, a couple other tenants were standing in their doorways. It appeared none of them dared to interfere. <sighs> Charlie and Doris, Jack went on. I know everything. I felt everything. The rolling pin, the Chevy Impala. I know where the bodies are, Al. The jig is up. Al's chest was rising and falling rapidly. His face, though, had turned from despondent to defeated. <sighs> the suit, huh? Charlie's suit, Jack said. It showed me. It showed me everything. A pause. The tenants stood wide-eyed in their doorways. Al looked down. Well, I'll be damned, he said. 
I should have known that bastard could do more than just reappear. Mm. Hell, I'd have kept that room myself if I knew it. Damn suit just gave me the creeps. How could you have done that? You murdered them, Al. You've got no idea what she put me through, Jack. The cheating, the running around. I was just so angry. You beat her, Jack said. You beat her. You raped her. And you killed her. And I can prove it. It's over, buddy boy. Al was pacing the end of the hallway. <sighs> you know, after 35 years, you'd think you're pretty much home free. <laughs> he chuckled ironically. <laughs> But a fella my age ain't exactly fit for prison. Another door opened then. At least five sets of eyes on Al now. Jack was grateful for them in case the desperate old man decided to try something. <sighs> Shouldn't complain though, Al continued. I had a good run while it lasted. <sighs> There's just one more thing you need to know before this is over. What's that? Asked Jack. <sighs> the toilet chains are on my desk. <sighs> you need one fixed. Fix it yourself. With that, the old man turned, ran for the window. Stop! Shouted Jack, but it was too late. He crashed through the glass head first. When Jake reached the window, he saw the broken and writhing figure five floors below, blood gathering in a pool around him, his arms and legs broken and bent at odd angles. He remembered the way Doris had looked after he'd beaten her. Thirty-five years it took, but Al had proved Charlie right. In the end, he would regret it. It took Al two hours to die but die he did. With no family or relatives to vouch for him, his body ended up in the cemetery for the unclaimed. Transgressions buried forever. All set up in the apartment now, Jack popped a beer and sat on the couch. The suit was hanging back in the closet where it belonged. He could get rid of it if he wanted to, he knew. With Charlie's soul at rest, there'd be no reason for it to come back again. It was all right, though. The suit no longer gave him the creeps. No more walking around the apartment at night, bedside visits, etc. He'd even had it cleaned. History aside, after all, it was a pretty nice suit. Some suits just beg to be worn, Jack thought. You've been listening to The Black Suit by Jeff Sturdivant. A good reminder that everything you do in life leaves an impression. Whether you hold the door for a lady, give a passing smile to a stranger, or beat someone's head in with a rolling pin, you'll likely leave an impression, corporeal or otherwise. More likely with the rolling pin than the other stuff, there's no harm in being a gentleman. A little about the author, Jeff Sturdivan is a five-time winner of the Schenectady Most Dashing Gentleman Contest. He invented corduroy underwear and holds the patent there, too. When he's not writing, you can find him making excuses for not writing. You can follow him on Facebook as Jeff Sturdivant and on Twitter at Flex Fiction. You can even try contacting him there. Once in a great while, he will say something. Tonight, for instance, Mr. Sturdivant would like to say this. Friends and neighbors, ladies and gentlemen, what I would like you to do is head over to iTunes and subscribe to the Drew Blood Podcast. Download all the episodes and leave a five-star review for our pal. It's one of those little things you can do that means so much. Imagine the good karma. It's like if I were holding a tray full of hors d'oeuvres for you, but instead of hors d'oeuvres, there were little bits of good karma with toothpicks, you know? And all you had to do was reach out and pick one. Thank you, everybody. Happy New Year.
To hear a premium ad-free edition of tonight's and all our other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu. You'll find yourself at chillintalesfordarknights.com, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month, and you'll get access to our entire audio archive dating all the way back to 2012, including past episodes of this program and all our other shows, and hundreds of standalone releases, all of them ad-free and available to download or stream. Thanks for your time and for supporting our sponsors. When you support our sponsors, you help support this show. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You'll find me personally on Facebook, Twitter, as well as Instagram. Come on by and say hi, y'all. I won't bite you. Much. I'd also like to mention that we are accepting submissions. If you've got a story or two you'd like to be featured on this show, Send it to DrewBloodHorror at gmail.com. If selected, you can help us ring in the new year. Well, I'm afraid this is where we part ways, friends. At least till next year. So grab a juice box for the road. And if you're watching the ball drop in Times Square tonight, tell old Dick I say hi. And remember... You can pee anywhere you want now, as long as you've got your mask on. So until then, friend, may the wind be at your back. May the road rise up to meet you. And remember, point the champagne bottle away from your friends when you pop that cork. Unless you want to take someone's eye out, that is. (laughs) Happy New Year, y'all.